you know, do this. Yes, thank you um, for doing this webinar. I will say this, if you guys happen to have any questions, um, you can put it in the chat. I, I probably won't address them until the end, just for the sake of, you know, fluidity in the presentation. And we have a little time to talk on uh, at the end, but I'm happy to be here. Happy Thursday. We're almost to the weekend. Thank goodness. Semester is winding down. I know some of you guys are probably just as happy as I am. I'm looking forward to May. Um, just to kind of tell you a little bit about myself and, you know, why I decided to talk about exercise in special populations. I will say this has been requested, but I also kind of have a love for working with special populations. And so a little bit about my profession and experience. My name is Whitney Pape. I work over here at the rec center is where my office is. Um, I'm the assistant director of fitness, and I have two coordinators. You have probably met them before, Michaela and Charles, that work with our personal training staff, our group exercise staff. My duties include overseeing our programs, but I specifically teach Pilates on the reformers and other apparatus as well. Um, my background is in exercise science and health studies. I've been a personal trainer uh, certified since 2007 and a group fitness instructor since 2007 as well. Um, I've completed my yoga training, 200 hours, which is like bare minimal. If you've ever taken yoga before, 200 hours seems like a lot, but there's way more to learn. And so um, there's trainings that go even further and beyond that. But 200 was where I decided I wanted to be. Um, and I'm currently working through my full comprehensive Pilates instructor training that's taken me about four years or so to do where I, I can work with all bodies on all pieces of equipment post rehab, um, you name it. So I enjoy what I do over at the rec center. I love working with our students and it's fun to see them on their journey and how they start, uh, you know, whether they're in kinesiology and they want to become an instructor or they're a business major and they want to become instructor or personal trainer, we get them all everywhere. So I really enjoy getting to learn um, about what their aspirations are and um, work with my staff. So Exercise in special populations. Um, I'll be honest, when I first became a personal trainer, when I first started teaching group classes, special populations freaked me out because when you first get certified, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to work people out. It's going to be great. We're going to reach our goals and um, it's going to be awesome. And then the moment you're given that client that has diabetes or is recovering from uh, a bout with cancer, you kind of stop in your tracks and you're like, I don't know if I'm prepared for this. Um, and so I can honestly say when I first started working with bodies and moving bodies, way different outlook than it is now. Now I actually love special populations because I feel confident in my skill set, but also I've just found the right resources. And I think that's all it takes. And so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what you should do if you fall in these special populations, but then also giving ourselves a little grace um, and empowering ourselves to know the right th right questions to ask, the right uh, people to look to for answers. Um, so I am gonna start by saying I am not a doctor. <laughs> uh, sometimes wish I was, cause I think it'd be very cool to work with people and help treat um, people for different diseases and work with them on that level. But I am a fitness professional. So I tend to get people after physical therapy or after they've been diagnosed and their doctor says, you need to exercise and you get your, your prescription and they say you should exercise and eat better. And you don't know what you're supposed to do with that. And so that's when they usually come to us. So before we begin an exercise program, we always want to obtain medical clearance. Um, this isn't necessarily for everybody, um, definitely our special populations, when you have filled out paperwork, your health history, your PARQ, your physical activity readiness questionnaire, it's going to vet through, you know, your, your symptoms, your illnesses, you might fall into these categories and not have been diagnosed with anything. And sometimes we see it from our end and we say, you know what, before we work with you, we would love a physician's note saying that you're clear to exercise. And we actually do that a lot. Um, anytime you sign up for our personal training services, anytime you sign up for a Pilates reformer, you have to fill out that medical history paperwork. It's kind of long, but once you do it, it's done. You don't have to do it again um, unless something else comes up in your history. And so we look through that to make sure that we're making the right decisions and we're placing with you with the right trainer and possibly getting medical 
uh, clearance from your doctor. I will say it's important that you do your own research. If you get diagnosed with something, kind of freak out. I mean, it's something that's new in your life. You're going to have to learn new behaviors, change your eating, change your exercise, take me medication, but you should always do your own research to know what exercises are safe for you, um, what exercises you should be doing, if there's any contraindicated movements, which your fitness professional should know that, but if they are newer to the game, they may not know. And so for you to be well equipped to know what you should and shouldn't be doing. I always like to empower my clients because it's your body and we shouldn't always just assume that somebody is going to have our best interests uh, in mind. Hopefully they would though, right? Find a professional. Um, so if you're doing your research and you're looking for um, a fitness professional to help you start losing weight so that you can combat diabetes or hypertension, or maybe you're diagnosed with cancer and you're about to go through treatment and what that looks like and what type of exercises you can do, um, you need to find someone that's well versed in that. And we don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. I feel like I've learned a lot through the years, but I'm constantly seeking that knowledge so that I can help my um, participants and my clients. But you want to find somebody that's credible. You want to find somebody that has a nationally accredited certification. So some of the certifications that we use over at the Rex are that we look for, we're hiring on our um, trainers and instructors, um, ACSM. ACE, NASM, AFA, Straight Thing Conditioning Specialists, just ones that if you were to Google on the internet, uh, the, the internet, you're going to see that they have the stamp of approval and that they're legit. It's not a certification. You could sit down at your computer and knock it out in 30 minutes. It, it's going to take a prep course. It's going to take experience. It's going to take studying the materials, a study guide, someone that is willing to do the research for you. And you know that based on the certification that they have. Talk to your doctor. Um, I, I think, well, actually, I feel like everybody would probably talk to their doctor. If you're diagnosed with something, you have a lot of questions. Um, ask them about any limitations. Uh, go into that research mind of what can I do? What can't I do? And see if um, there's anything, you know, you're limited on if there's any barriers. Um, use sources that are credible. Uh, I, I feel like I could kind of go off on a little tangent about not using TikTok or Instagram for your credible sources. Although there are some amazing influencers out there that have had personal stories and that um, can really be truly inspiring. A lot of times those influencers don't have their credentials. They don't have certifications. They've just done what works well for them. So anytime you go through your social media feed, I think it's important to realize that we need to have those credible sources. So using them as motivation is great, but what kind of information are they giving you and does it work for what you're trying to do? And then the last thing just to keep in mind before you get started is you want to create a baseline to see progress. And this could be measuring your body fat. This could be circumference measurement. This could be weight. If you're doing your well Bama screenings, I think um, getting your finger pricked uh, is very helpful to see that. Have you made progress the year later? Are you doing blood work with your doctor? Um, your general overall feeling of success. I think sometimes we view exercise uh, specifically from the science side of it, but we forget that there is this emotional component um, of alleviating stress. And there is a science behind it of letting the endorphins and the chemicals kick in for that natural high, if you will, um, to help with our emotions, to help with what we're going through and how we're coping with um, maybe bad news or maybe the illnesses that we've been diagnosed with. So this just kind of a little reminder. Some of us may already have this and be like, okay, I got it. I talk to my doctor, I research, but it's a good reminder to know that not every, you know, everybody's human and we might not always have the answers. So just watching out for those things. All right. So when I was thinking about most common special populations and kind of in terms of who I specifically work with is where I created this little, you know, six bullet point chart. Um, and I put them sort of in order <laughs> of like what I'm most comfortable with or what I've had experience with, not to say that I don't feel comfortable with other things, but again, you have to do your research because there's so many special populations out there. This is kind of our go-to list for fitness and who we see. And so I'm just going to go through them together. If you have a question about some of these, write it down. We'll get to it at the end. If I can't answer it, or if I stumble and I'm like, you know, I don't know, I'm going to have to do my research. You can shoot me an email. I'm happy to do that. 
my favorite category, and yes, I'm totally playing favorites because I love active aging, which is kind of like a fancy little term for our senior citizens, our individuals that may be over 65. 65 is not old by any means, but that's when we start to get into those golden years and our bodies are changing. Um, and we're starting to really see some differences in our cognitive um, development, I guess, if you want to say, and physical. I love active aging. I work with a group. I work with a couple of group of, of individuals uh, at Capstone Village, awesome, super motivated people, and also um, a recovery group here at the rec center. And I have a client that's, I think, 81, 82, maybe this year. A lot of times with this particular group, we forget that they're fully capable and they may have had experiences in their life where they were active or they like to do physical activity. And I think as a fitness professional, especially when you're younger, you kind of put them in this category of, oh, they can't do things. Well, they are fully capable. So we just have to realize where the strengths lie and what we need to be working on because this particular category is going to fall into some of the other categories that we're going to talk about later. Um, we tend to focus more on balance and strength and functional movement patterns. And I know balance when you're younger, you don't think a lot about it because it's very natural that your sense of balance really is pretty good for the most part, unless you're just kind of clumsy <laughs> in general. But um, balance is super important for our active aging population. Um, there's the common story of I've fallen and I can't get up. And that seems kind of like we're like, oh, okay, that happens. No, 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 it really does happen. So if we can prevent someone from having a fall, that's important. But also if we can give them the strength and have them move through these functional components, if they do fall, they can get back up. And so working on functional movement starts as early as when you're 20 years old, you're learning how to move your body in a sense that um, you're efficient in your movement. You're gaining strength and mobility in your movement. It increases the quality of life. We know that exercise makes you feel better. It's, it's honestly, I could take one slide and I can literally just write exercise makes you feel better for the most part. And that could be how we end this presentation today, because all these categories that you're going to notice, there is a component of physical activity, um, for active aging adults. Basically, we're following national guidelines of 150 minutes of physical activity a week, which is what you've heard in other presentations. Um, it decreases the risk of disease. It creates mobility. Um, I also like to kind of go back to the, the strength part of it. Um, with some of the individuals that I work with, the, the feeling of doing strength training is interesting for them because they don't know how to differentiate like the difference between pain and muscle soreness. And it's not just for our active aging individuals. It's also for people that are new to exercise. There's a difference between having joint pain or having sharp pain from a nerve or having dull pain from tendonitis or arthritis. We, we have to focus on the actual muscle that's um, engaging in the exercise and sort of that burning sensation that will go away. And there's also a delayed onset of muscle soreness a couple of days later, if you are new to activity. So one thing I've noticed, if you've got um, parents or grandparents or family members, friends that fall into this category, when they start doing exercise, they want to stop because it's uncomfortable and they don't understand that, yes, the body is going through a, a, a sense of stress to become stronger and more efficient. And so they just want to stop the movement. I have a, a sweet lady, I love her to death, and she's in my breast cancer stretch class and she lifts, lifts her weights, her cute little five pound weights, and she's doing great. And then all of a sudden we'll be done with a, a set and she'll just like throw her arms down. It, it's like, she just feels like, oh, that hurts. And, and trying to explain to her the difference between hurting like a joint pain or a sharp nerve pain is always interesting compared to the actual muscle pain. And so that just comes with being intuitive with your body, learning how your body moves, um, a mind-body connection, which you've probably heard people say in our yoga classes and Pilates classes. I always like to educate uh, individuals in this category so that they know that what they're feeling is normal and their, their bodies are supposed to react that way. And to try to, as my, me being an instructor, try to give them the right cues and information to differentiate the, the pain that they're feeling. Also, our active aging group, they love community. 
Um, some of our individuals are cooped up in their rooms at home or in, at Capstone Village, and they really thrive on a 30 minute little light dance class to work on balance and functional movement or coming over to the rec center to lift a few weights. And they need that cognitive um, interaction um, to talk to somebody. And I think we could all agree that Exercise can definitely stimulate that in a community, but um, it also stimulates the mind. It helps you to bring focus, especially for our dementia patients. Um, exercise does help with dementia early on, we've read, but also when you are in this aging category. So they're my favorite people. I can't lie. I love them. Um, and it's just fun to also hear stories and, and to learn about people in that category, in that in that group. Okay, that leads me to osteoporosis. Um, and the reason why I picked this one is when I work with people uh, on the reformers, I don't necessarily always get the super able-bodied people that are looking to work out and get tone. You know, the media kind of like to, to paint that picture. But when we work with people on our machines, they're post-rehab. They have herniated disc. They have knee replacements. They have hip replacements. They have cancer. I mean, they they are all over the board. And so one category that I'm very specific and intentional with is my osteoporosis category. And so it is a bone disease. Um, it's not super great. And so we have to focus on things that build strength um, and also promote balance. And so there's a couple of different ways to look at osteoporosis. Number one, you have osteoporosis, which you are diagnosed and you're you're in this disease. And then osteopenia, if you've heard that term before, that's before you get to osteoporosis. And so you're kind of on that line where, you know, you're heading in the wrong direction. So with medication and treatment and a change in lifestyle, adding an exercise, you can avoid getting into the osteoporosis category. It's going to affect your tiny little white ladies and Asian women. It runs in my family. Um, it is, uh, uh, we look at it in prevention. So by the time you're age 30, you've created the um, bone density that you're going to have. You can gain bone density and maintain it, but it, it's just very important to make sure when you're young. So if you're listening to this and you are in that category of, you know, you're in your 20s, maybe early 30s, you do need to be lifting weights, especially if you're a female. Males can also get osteoporosis, but um, physical activity is our, our prevention for that. Um, alcohol and moderation. Alcohol, I think we're going to see in these slides, if you are heavily consuming it, it's not super great. Um, it can uh, increase the risk of a lot of diseases, osteoporosis being one of them, especially if you are already in your golden years. Um, you know, moderating your alcohol is important. Not smoking, um, that also increases your risk of osteoporosis, making sure you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D together. Um, and that's been one of the, I'm, I'm not a dietitian. I am a fitness professional. So I allow my dietitian friends to discuss those things, but we do know that calcium and vitamin D are going to help maintain strong bones and prevent osteoporosis. So let's talk about the, um, exercise side of it. Uh, weight bearing, <laughs> which is literally, if you look on the internet and you're like osteoporosis, how do I help myself? It's going to say weight bearing exercises. And a lot of times I will have, so I ask me, well, what types of exercises can I do? And I'm like, well, anything that's going to add weight to your body is going to stress the bone and strengthen the bone, right? And also strengthen the muscles and the joints. And so that it's this holistic approach to the entire body. Walking is super great. Um, riding a bike is super great. But I, for my osteoporosis people, I really like to focus on strength training. I really like to focus on getting on a reformer and pushing against spring tension, um, feeling that burn in the muscles. Um surprisingly little jumping like jumps on the ground like little heel jumps are good to stress the bone um jumping on a jump board on the reformer where we actually put a foot plate on the reformer you do little jumps back and forth is great for osteoporosis um working the major muscle group so thinking broad so thinking about squats loaded squats or lunges and obviously if you have other issues joint pain things like that you have to be careful with that but we do need to be loading the body with resistance. Um, balance is important. 
I, I have some ladies, like I said earlier, that I work with and balance is like a really big deal for them. Um, you can tell they're nervous. If I have them stand on one foot, it's like, well, I got to get near a wall and that's fine. But there's a sense of, you know, I'm going to fall and I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to break a bone. And that's reality, right? So we have to make sure we're working on balance. And I always recommend for balance, if you're in your kitchen and you're just like happen to you know, be waiting for something to cook or something's in the oven, see if you can find really good posture and just stand on one foot and do it barefooted. I think a lot of people forget you have muscles and fascia in your feet and they are creating the base support of your body. So you wearing a shoe, unless a doctor is recommended that you do wear a shoe all the time, because we have some people that are like that, um, take your shoes off feel connected to the floor, balance barefoot. It's very, very important to do that. Work on the core strength. Core strength just means the inner unit of your body, um, the muscles involved are your pelvic floor muscles, the diaphragm, the muscles in your spine, uh, your transverse abs. Those are the things that support your movement in all aspects of life. So if you are holding those muscles in strongly, your balance will increase and practice. I mean, you have to practice all the time. It doesn't just come overnight. I will say this, there are things that osteoporosis uh, patients, individuals have to avoid. And this is very serious because if you ever go to a class and an instructor doesn't mention these things, you need to know for yourself, okay? So before I get into that, another thing I would recommend is if you are meeting with your doctor and um, they have done x-ray or scan to see where your osteoporosis in, is in your body, that's gonna help you decide what things you need to avoid. If you have osteoporosis in your spine, you will avoid unsupported loaded forward flexion and flexion with a twist. And all that means is it's like fancy anatomical terms for as you bend over and as you flex your spine, you're putting stress on those vertebrae. And if you're in a loaded position, you have a very, very high risk of fracturing your vertebrae. And so we work with a lot of clients thinking about hinging from the hips, doing a functional movement exercise. If you have to reach down in your kitchen and you dropped a fork or a pan or something, instead of leaning over and finding a rounded position of your spine, you'll keep your back flat and you'll bend from your knees and hinge from your hips. Okay. That's a very contraindicated way uh, unsupported flexion of the spine even adding a twist um, that has shown to cause uh, vertebrae fractures another example if you're working out and you have osteoporosis in your spine russian twist i think I, if you don't know what that is it's when you're seated and you're round and you're twisting side to side same thing. It's contraindicated. It runs the risk of fracturing the vertebrae. So in Pilates, you have somebody that's going to work with you as a personal trainer. They should know these things. Um, so just being aware of them. But it's very important that you build core strength without loading and flexing your spine. Crunches, contraindicated, which might be a load off for everybody that's been doing crunches. It's not my favorite ab exercise because there's a lot of contraindicated indications with it. And for core strength, we can do it in so many different ways. Doing a plank, a kneeling plank, super safe for our osteoporosis clients, but also working in extension. So the opposite way, rather than rounding your spine, working in an extended position, doing back exercises is super beneficial to keep the spine nourished, but also work on strength in the core. So those are just some things um, to think about the osteoporosis. I'm very adamant on some of these contraindicated exercises. Um, and I'm happy, you know, like I said, if you need to ask me a question, maybe in private, or through email, we can talk more about that. Um, but let's move on because I feel like for the sake of time, okay, pregnancy, this is not going to apply to everybody, but I do want to touch on this. Um, it's perfectly okay to exercise when you're pregnant. In fact, it is recommended that you exercise when you're pregnant. However, I will say if you've never exercised, and I mean, not just like occasionally here and there, but like you really like don't have a prescription or you don't have a program that you do, you need to go in this very carefully. Your body is going through a lot of changes. Relaxin is releasing to open up muscles and ligaments and joints to prep the body for um, childbirth. And so there's a tendency to kind of overdo it or maybe spike your blood pressure. So I think 
in this sense, your doctor is going to be very helpful telling you what you cannot and can do. Um, another thing um, I like to focus on is uh, it lowers the risk of low back pain. Um, if you have a mass on the front of you, you're going to carry that load in your back. Um, so finding things that you can do to relieve that, there's going to be a time where you can't lay on your back anymore. Um, and so maybe the trainer or maybe your exercise specialist can work on some ways to give you strength and movement without actually having you go into those positions. But I won't talk too much about this. The only other thing that I will say is I have worked with people that after they've had a baby, they have a diastasis, um, which if, if you have it, you know what it is. Basically, your linea alba just is not like connected where it's come apart, where your rectus and your... Um, obliques and internal obliques kind of all feed into that area. Um, and so you will want to avoid any crunching. You're going to think like an osteoporosis client because you can actually close that gap with specific core work that's in the form of planks. And that goes for some of, there's guys that have that as well, that have bodybuilders, things like that. Um, so be mindful that if you do go to a class and the instructor is having you do a bunch of crunches and you know you have a diastasis, you do not want to do crunches because that will make it worse and also it won't heal. So that's just something to consider. So um, I'll kind of leave that slide at that and we'll just move on to our next slide. All right. So diabetes. Um, I think with diabetes, what we need to realize is our body isn't super efficient at turning food into energy, which is why we have to have insulin and with the mechanics and the physiology of the body, it's good to number one, eat things that are healthy, but it's also good to um, create movement and exercise and be strategic with that. Um, I will say losing weight is important with diabetes. Uh, not everybody that has diabetes is necessarily overweight. And so you wouldn't necessarily want to lose weight in that sense, but moving the body and uh, getting the muscles to use the sugar um, effectively is important. Um, taking your medication, very important as well. There's a reason why we have it and it's to help regulate um, the systems of the body. Um, one thing to think about though, is your blood sugar could rapidly increase during high intensity exercise or you could have low blood sugar. And I think it depends when you first start working out. And I've seen this a couple of, couple of ways. I don't work with a lot of diabetic clients with, with Pilates because we don't technically exert tons of energy at one time. But when I was doing a lot of personal training, it was very strategic for that person to know when to eat. Also when to test their blood sugar because it can fluctuate and change if you're keeping up with that. Um, bouts of exercise are good. So doing like a hit training exercise, like short bouts, but also throughout the day. So instead of planning for a hour long workout, which an hour long of, you know, expelling energy, that's, that's a long time. So we find that like short amounts of exercise of, over the course of a day, really for anybody is a better use of blood of, um, burning sugar and maintaining blood sugar rather than saving it all for one time, uh, one main workout. One main workout's great. Don't get me wrong. You definitely want to keep, keep being active, but if you can think about your day, you know, you eat breakfast and maybe take a walk after you eat to help metabolize the food, that would probably be a better option than sitting down and letting it metabolize. And this isn't, um, I guess, you know, you, you've heard the old wise tale of like, wait 30 minutes before you go and jump in a pool. That's just because your, your, your blood flow is going to your gut to churn it up. So you're doing high vigorous activity, but if you're doing moderate activity, it'd be okay. Go for a walk after you eat um, and make sure you're doing strength training. Make sure you're building muscle. Muscle's more efficient. Muscle's going to help your metabolism increase. It's going to be a better steward of your sugars. Um, and so two to three days a week, um, all major muscle groups. And what's really cool about working out in combination exercise of like a squat and a press, you get it done. You, you squat, you press, you've worked. 
about 10 muscle groups at one time and it's efficient and it's timely. You're not going to have to worry about spending lots of time on a certain workout or muscle group. So I, I would always recommend for diabetic patients to consult your doctor, work with your trainer, monitor your sugar and start moving your body, do cardio and do strength. Those are super important to um, regulate all the metabolic things in your body. All right. Okay. Musculoskeletal issues. This is another one I, I, I really like and I geek out about because um, our bodies just hurt sometimes. And sometimes they are diagnosed with arthritis, fibromyalgia, carpal tunnel, tendinitis, all the things. So this category is going to kind of be our catch-all for the uh, issues we have in our joints and then the muscular issues. And this could even fall into the category of like knee replacement, hip replacement, and things like that. So one thing I'd like to talk about is, is the spine, the hips, the low back area. Um, I, I really believe just from my experience, if we can focus on these areas of the body, which is your, your, um, axial skeleton, it's, it's the part of the body that is the center and the appendicular, your arms and legs is the stuff that goes out from the center. Um, I think it's important because it creates, as Joe Pilates would say, your powerhouse, which it's like a ripple effect. Once you're strong in your powerhouse, and you have good mobility and strength. The other things that you do happen naturally. Okay. And I'm not saying it's going to be the cure, but I think if we can start looking at it from a spine and hip position, I think it does a lot of good, at least from my experiences. So just a couple of things, you've got space in your vertebrae, you have your disc in your vertebrae. A lot of us probably on this zoom suffer from stenosis of the spine, herniated disc, bulging disc, all the things, you know, you're going to the chiropractor, you're getting adjusted, you're getting put back in place, but then that only lasts for so long and then you have to go back. So in what I do, I look at, okay, how can we correct the movement patterns of the body? It's like, it's like you're, you know, a detective and you see something doesn't look right, but like, what is it? Like what, like what's not right in this movement? So with my clients, I always focus on elongation of the spine. So elongation is your posture and your posture is simple as sitting up nice and tall, but a lot of people don't understand the components of posture, right? So posture, you can do it right now if you want. And I think I've probably talked about this multiple times on other webinars, but you know, like when we're sitting in our desk and we're you know, doing a Zoom call, we're kicked back. I mean, I was kicked back, but we start to lower the chest down. You know, we start to hump the upper back. We're that very upper cross syndrome. Our necks are in the wrong position. We, we basically take in a perfectly designed spine with the curves of the spine and putting it all out of whack. So then the lower back lumbar area is having to take most of that load, or maybe the muscles are super tight. Maybe the hip flexors are super tight. So if we can kind of start thinking about our posture in general, um, even when we're standing in line at the store, I always like to think ears over shoulders. So in general, we're all kind of here, but ears over shoulders, ribs up. So they're not down, but you're open in your chest. And then my favorite part is the core side of it where you're just slightly kind of curled in your hips. So if you think about your sits bones, like a skeleton, you have a pelvis, and you got the ischial tuberosities, which are like the little bumps at the bottom. That's where you should be sitting. And so a lot of us sit in front of those sits bones or we sit behind the sits bones. If you're in front of the sits bones, your low back's tight. If you're behind the sits bones, you probably have too much tension in your head flexors. And so figuring out in your body, again, it's kind of like your own reflection of how you move in space. Everybody's different in how you sit. If we can start to find good posture and a sense of lengthening up through the crown of the head, it then creates more space in the vertebrae. Um, it creates space and support for your lumbar spine. So your thoracolumbar fascia is this area in your low back that if it, all your muscles kind of come together, but if you have good posture and you have a brace of your core, not like sucking in your abdominals, but like a, like a sense of lifting and support, like a belt, that internal support, that's thoracolumbar fascia kind of starts to engage. And it actually creates like 
this like a sausage casing in your spine where it kind of lengthens up. So it's really, it's kind of simple. Like if you have some joint problems, I, I always want to look at the spine and the hips first because everything else comes from that. So if you can find the right location of your hips, a neutral position location of your spine, some of those other issues with the hips and the shoulders, they just kind of will go away. Not all of them, mind you, but like they can. Um, spinal articulation. Your spine is the, like the joints in your spine are small. They don't get a lot of movement, but your spine is super important because it has your spinal column connected to your head. It's, I mean, you don't have it, you don't move. So you have to figure out how to move your spine. And there's three ways you move your spine and you should be doing this every day. You flex your spine, unless you're osteoporosis. Unfortunately, you have to be very careful. That's why you need your x-ray to know if it's in your spine. You extend your spine. You flex a cat cow. So if you ever did yoga, a cat cow, you can do it sitting at your desk. That's the first way. Second way, laterally moving your spine. Because we're all sitting, our QLs, the back of, from your pelvis to your 12th rib are super tight. So we need to work on lateral flexion. We need to work on translating that rib over to the hip to open up space. And then the third mood of your spine is twisting. Not like a hard twist where you're trying to like crank into it. A twist is actually a muscle movement of the rib cage. It's your obliques moving your ribs around your spine. So instead of like cranking into your back and causing more pressure into your lumbar, you just move with your, your strength. So you allow the abdominals to move the spine side to side. So spinal articulation is important because if you don't move your spine, you will run into the risk of having um, stenosis and things like that, where the spine starts to kind of shorten and it's a degenerative type of disease. Again, not like it's always going to help you, but it at least prevents and hopefully keeps your spine um, healthy. Uh, moving through your range of motion, your range of motion not the yoga instructor's range of motion, but your range of motion is important. Um, a couple of little things that I put here is um, upper cross and lower cross syndrome. Um, you could kind of Google that to get a visual of it and just see, but upper cross is what I talked about. You're here, you're hunched over, tight chest, stretched back. There's no balance in the body. So therefore, if the muscles are tight, the joints, I mean, the body adjusts to the way it's going to adjust to be as efficient as possible. And it's gonna cause pain to other issues of the body. Um, lower cross syndrome is uh, low back is tight, hips are tight from sitting. So sitting's not super great. Probably need to get up and move a little bit. Um, yeah, so you can work on these issues and start to correct and start small. Just start with like your pelvis. Am I sitting in a good position? Am I, you know, my ears over my shoulders, just some awareness that could start to help some of these issues like carpal tunnel and tendinitis. Uh, fibromyalgia is different though. Um, we find that people that um, need to get in like a warm therapeutic pool, that's more helpful. So um, thinking more along the lines for arthritis and fibromyalgia, they're similar in the sense that you have to just go day by day with how you feel, unfortunately, um, but definitely moving the body is going to help. Chronic conditions, I kind of put these all on like one slide because I don't know if you guys have noticed a the theme, <laughs> but there are things that you can do to prevent these things um, or to decrease the risk of them. Obviously, your family history um, is going to take, you know, play a big part in all of this and knowing your family history, I think is super important. Um, but we have to maintain a healthy weight. Um, everybody is created very individually and everybody looks very individual and everybody has a different, um, bone structure and, um, heritage and ethnicity. And those are all really good things. And so one of the things that I love about the Wellbama program is you get to see your numbers. You know what I mean? Like you get to see them, your baseline, and you get to start a program where, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to start doing something to correct this. And if you change your eating, if you change your lifestyle, whether it's avoiding tobacco, uh, tobacco, eliminate alcohol, protect your skin, all these things, it, 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 they kind of all go hand in hand. Once you make one change to your behavior, the other things start to kind of snowball. And I think that's kind of cool that it can sometimes be easier than people think. 
start with just one thing, one thing that you know, oh, I can really do this. I could add like a salad to my pizza on Friday nights and that would incorporate some greens to my meal and help with digestion. And then, oh, I kind of like eating salads now. Maybe I'll avoid the pizza this meal. So I think giving ourselves a little grace is sometimes helpful when we're kind of hit with all of the, the knowledge that we get. Um, aerobic exercise. These are your um, your heart pumping exercises, um, your cardios. This is great. Um, I, I do want to talk specifically about uh, cancer. Um, there's a lot of different forms of cancer, and obviously you do need to consult your physician, but most of the time the physician is going to say, if you feel up to it, depending on your treatment, that's fine. Some will say you need to complete treatment before you go into it. And I think the biggest thing with cancers is knowing the space that you're going into, if you are immune compromised, um, maybe wear a mask or maybe avoid a gym and try to do something at home. I work with a group of breast cancer stretch survivors. And when they first come to me, depending on, you know, what they've had done, some are very minor, some are, you know, double mastectomy, trauma to those areas. We work on just simply breathing breathing into that area, breathing into the chest, going through light stretches. And then we just very gradually build up. So if you have had a surgery or if you have had treatment, if you've had trauma and it's cool with your doctor, start very small and bring awareness to those areas. Start to do exercises that are very small so that you can build up to that range of motion because really range of motion and mobility, that's, that's super important when you've had a surgery, you know, building up the strength around the joint. Um, I will say you need to avoid inactivity, um, for all of these guidelines, everything, osteoporosis, pregnancy, um, cancers, high cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, all of them, you have to be active. Like your body has to move. And, um, when I was putting this slide together and I'm looking and there's not like a whole lot of differences between the special populations, aside from care and working with the doctor and being knowledgeable, everything is you have to move your body. You have to move your body, like get up from your desk, move around. And I know that that's probably difficult if you're in a population, like some of our um, clients that are very obese, it's hard to move your body when you have that much weight. And so we tend to get creative with the things that we do. Um, we have more machines now where it, it, it's a little bit more comfortable to move. We start small, like let's just move an arm. Let's just move an arm. Let's start small and then add in maybe adding, you know, both arms. And so I think if you can think little to bigger, it gives you a little bit more, you know, grace in your, um, in your methods. Um, so like I said, Overall, the guidelines are similar, but it kind of depends on the disease or issue and how you feel. Be mindful of how, how hard you go into it. Some people are very nervous to start working out again, depending on um, if it is cancer and they've had treatment um, because they don't have the energy level, right? And so that that is a concern. And so I always say, start with like 10 minutes. If that is just the beginning steps, it's like walking again, you just have to do it. You just have to move through. Um, we know exercise can decrease the risk. So why not do a little exercise? If it's going to give you that much more hope uh, to prevent the onset and you know, it's going to make you feel good. Well, why not do a little exercise? You know, why not just incorporate that um, in a very small scale into, um, into your routine? So I wanted to give plenty of time in case there were any questions. Like I said, I will do my best to answer them. And if I don't know the information, because like I said, I am not a doctor, uh, I am happy to find out that information um, and give it to you. So I'm actually going to go to our chat really quickly and see if I have any there. And if you're thinking about them right now, I'll give you some time um, and see what we have. So, okay, so I have one question I'm asking about knee injuries, um, torn meniscus and torn MCL. You know, if you have a tear, you should be consulting your orthopedic surgeon about that. Um, a tear in those areas are kind of hard to deal with. 
um, it, it, it's a cushion in your knee. And if it doesn't work correctly, the knee is a hinge joint, right? So it's like this and it goes like this. You got your femur, you've got your tibia and there's a little bit of rotation in it, but not much. Um, I would avoid super loaded work. So I would not, for this particular situation, I would not grab a bunch of heavy weights and do a split, a split squat, but I would grab a TheraBand and work on the strength around the knee as long as it doesn't hurt me. So for example, an exercise I would do, um, you know, you could lay on your back and do some bridging. So feet on the floor, pushing up, use your glutes and hamstrings, and then slowly lower down. Bridging is a super safe exercise. Your feet closer to your glutes or to your butt is going to make it more intense on the joint because it, it increases the angle that you're at or decreases the angle. I was bad in geometry. I, I had trouble with that, but decrease the angle. So the further your feet are out, the less tension there is on your knee. Avoiding exercises that force the knee over the toe. Um, if you are doing some light work, I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't load a lot, but I would do very functional movement and I would focus on strengthening your hips because your hips are what keep your knee and your thigh bone tracking. So if you can't do a lot of knee exercises, hip work, like you're bridging or uh, laying on your side, doing leg lifts out to the side work, think, think lateral and think back and then think stretch your hip flexors. So like a, a kneeling lunge or one of my favorites is I teach this in class all the time, get a yoga block or something you could slide under your pelvis on your back, like a bridge pose, but hug your knee into your chest and slide your other foot out so that you're, you're lengthening the stretch in your hip. Cause chances are there's probably some tension there in general that's causing some knee pain. So I'd work hips. There's not much you can really do around the knee. Cause it's just that hinge joint quads, hamstrings. That's it. So I'd work there in my opinion. Um, okay, tips on exercises that don't aggravate pain from the thoracic side of the spine. Like if you have degenerative disease, um, I would avoid first to start out any type of twisting from your lumbar spine that goes for everybody. So when you do a twist, it's never from the low back. It's always from your thoracic spine. That's just how your, your joints are designed to move. Um, so I would definitely avoid any type of deep twisting. Um, if you do deadlifts, um, and things down and up, be mindful of that type of work. So keeping that really, um, flat back position loaded, I wouldn't load the spine too much. So I wouldn't add super heavy weights. I would pick things that keep you in a very neutral position of your spine, or I would work on a little extension in your upper back. So extension your upper back is you're lying on your stomach with your hands on the mat and you're lifting your chest, but pulling forward just to create elongation. Like we talked about a couple of slides ago to try to open up the spine. But honestly, with low back stuff, you got to listen to your body when it hurts. That's your body telling you like, don't do that. <laughs> um, yes. So y'all, um, yeah, those are great questions. It's, it's, it's interesting to learn about the body and especially your own body, especially when you've had, um, an injury, your physical therapists are great. Share the physical, ask your physical therapist why they're doing that. You should always ask them like, why are you doing that exercise? Um, because I think it's important that you have the answer. So if you do work with a personal trainer or a Pilates instructor, they have that script and that they know, um, do y'all have any more questions? Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that would be kind of contraindicated for people. I mean, like I said, building building core strength is important um, and core strength is planking. Don't do crunches, just plank. Build strength and breath. Inhale through your nose, exhale, use your diaphragm, create that inner strength in your unit. Um, and I think that goes a long way for some of these spinal issues as well. Um, yeah. If y'all don't have any more questions, um, my name's Whitney and I'm over here at the rec center. Uh, my email address, I don't know why I didn't do this. I did not put it on the slide, but you could email, uh, well, Bama, if you wanted to, let's see. Um, I think I had a couple more. Oh, wait, hang on. When you have multiple issues. Oh yeah. Sorry guys. I just, I'm, I've got the Q and A and I got the chat. So I kind of forgot I had those there. Multiple issues. I yeah. Have email in the chat for wellness if anybody had any. Okay. 
Honestly, with multiple issues, you would have to work on a case by case basis because it depends on what the prominent issue is. You know, like if, if you're diagnosed with osteoporosis, okay, that's what we're looking at first. Um, so we have lupus, we have arthritis, plantar fascia, low lumbar. To be honest, plantar fascia can be cured with um, doing footwork, doing yoga, rolling the ball, working through the arches, mobilizing the feet, doing uh, hands-on um, mobility work with a massage therapist or yourself. Arthritis is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, some people feel really good when they exercise, getting in the pool, moving the body. I think the pool is super great for like lupus and arthritis. Lupus, you're going to be very tired, you know, and, and so you're having to find things that give you relief and mobility. So possibly a gentle yoga class, lumbar fusion, you don't move that area of your spine. So if you were to take a yoga class, if you were to take a Pilates class, you would work in a very neutral position. You can't move that part of your spine. So the relief, while you don't get to round that part of the spine, like in a cat position, you can still work on rounding the upper back thoracically to stretch through those areas, stretching through hip flexors and things like that. You just have to think a little differently. But if it were me and I were working with you, I would kind of look at one thing and then kind of go to the next thing. And it's just, it's like this conversation that we're having. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, oh, I miss, uh, I wish everybody could go to my Pilates class too. I, I will say this. Um, if you're interested, um, we do have, well, I teach a Matt Pilates class on Fridays and it's been very well attended lately. Um, I think because Pilates is like super popular on TikTok now. I have no idea, but it's just whatever people love it, which is great for us. Um, but if you ever want to come, um, it'd be great for you to give it a try. If you're a member at the rec center, um, that would be awesome. If you have questions about it, I love for you to, you know, ask me about, I, I give you levels, you know, just work at your own, your own pace. That's just all, that's just what it is day by day. Right. Um, so I'd love for y'all to come over. If you ever want to come talk to me, if you want to try the reformer and get in for a free session, we do 30 minutes for free to assess and just let you see if it would work for you holler at me. But um, I think with that, y'all just enjoy your Thursday. Let me know what I can do to help. Keep moving. Don't stop moving. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Lenny. That was great. Thanks.